San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. And um, it's really um, a fantastic organization. I've loved being a board member and working with this science and education based nonprofit. Um, and so I just wanted to mention, we also have another board member here, our board chair, who is Jan Hintemeister. And um, Kristen Butler back here, she um, organizes all of these types of events. And if you want to volunteer with SFBBO, there are lots of opportunities. And uh, we would love to have you. So let me introduce Gabby. Um, she is a, um, oh, i got to go down here again. <laughs> Whoa, sorry about that. OK. I'm almost there. Let's see. Here we go. OK. All right. So um, Gabby Burns is um, a science outreach and colonial water bird intern. And by the way, the colonial water bird program is a really amazing program. We need to say that again. So, um, and we're always looking for volunteers for that. Um, so um, Gabby earned a BS in computer science, which is really a useful, very useful <laughs> degree at Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, but along the way discovered that wildlife was truly a passion. And so she's currently working towards a Master of Arts degree in biology through the Advanced Inquiry Program, which I hadn't heard of. It's very interesting. Offered jointly by uh, Miami University of Ohio. Yep. Of Ohio. And um, the San Diego Zoo Global. So um, her focus there is on um, direct human threats to urban wildlife. And I can totally identify with that, because that's the type of research I do, too. So um, so thank you so much for giving this talk this evening. And let's welcome Gabby. Put the mic back on. Uh, OK, thank you for that introduction. Um, so the title of my talk is Exploring the Research Potential of Underutilized Wildlife Records. Uh, and there's a lot of big words in that, and a lot of questions about what exactly that means. And that is what we are going to dive into tonight. Um, so as I already mentioned, um, some of you may know me as SFBBO's intern. Um, I've been doing science outreach work since August. Uh, with the organization. And then in January, I also started coordinating the Colonial Water Bird uh, Citizen Science Volunteering Program. But I am also a graduate student as part of an online program called Project Dragonfly, um, which many people haven't heard of, uh, so don't feel bad, Lynn. Uh, it's a collaboration between Miami University, Ohio, which many people have also never heard of. Um, and they partner with zoos around the country to offer it. So I'm in the cohort that is based out of the San Diego Zoo, uh, and I do classes through their Institute for Conservation Research. And I'm about two years into that program. I'll be wrapped up in December. It is an inquiry-based learning program. Uh, so that's why it's called the Advanced Inquiry Program. Um, that means that it's not really the same as a traditional master's program that you might see somewhere else. There's a lot less structure. Uh, and a lot less faculty involvement. So you're not necessarily working under an advisor. Um, all of the courses have instructors, but everyone in the class could be doing completely different tracks. Um, there are a lot of educators, a lot of people interested in research and field work. And so they kind of just send us loose to do our own things as part of this, this program. Um, we do, instead of a thesis, we do an individual project in each of our classes. And then they build together to create a final master's portfolio around a central theme. Um, so my theme is direct human threats to urban wildlife. And uh, when I say direct threats, I mean the kind of things that are byproducts of us just going about our daily lives. So things like uh, vehicle strikes or window strikes, um, domestic cat predation, incidental poisoning, and the kind of things that are a huge issue and that we as individuals um, can actually exercise a lot of control over. Um, so tonight I'm here to talk about one of the projects I did on that topic for class, uh, and then some wider takeaways that came out of it. Uh, so the very first project I did in this program, uh, just about two years ago, was also the most open-ended one we had. Uh, the only real guidance we were given was create and try to answer some kind of comparative question on literally any topic. Um, it's a biology degree, so it was like, it should probably relate to biology, but it could be 
animal behavior, animal science, uh, environmental aspects, human behavior, just go nuts. Uh, and the only other requirement was we had to do six to eight hours of data collection, which if you have done any data collection for citizen science or your own research work, you know that that is actually basically no time at all. Um, that's basically enough time to get out in the field and experiment with your methodology. Uh, the issue was we only had six weeks to complete the entire project from submitting an idea for approval to developing a methodology, doing the research, uh, coming up with a draft report, peer reviewing, and then finalizing it. Um, so not a ton of time. Uh, that's fairly typical, because like I mentioned, we do a, diff a new project in each course each semester. So any research we do ends up being pilot studies, um, which has its, its pros and cons. Um, but it was my first project. I was really ambitious. And I wanted to feel like I was actually making steps towards answering a question instead of just doing some exercise for the sake of practice. Um, and realistically, some projects, even if you have one to two years to collect data, it's still not necessarily enough data to draw meaningful conclusions because so many things take place over life cycle or multi-life cycle trends. Um, and that's one of the things that first drew me to citizen science uh, and the idea that there's all of this data being collected now before people necessarily have questions. And so then you have baseline data from before there's an issue. Uh, and that's one of my favorite things about SFBBO and SFBBO's work. Um, for those that don't know, the Colonial Waterbird program that we mentioned and other programs at SFBBO have been continually running for over 30 years. Uh, so that is now 30 years or more of data that we have on bird populations in the Bay Area that's uh, that we work with, that we share with partners, that we share with students who are interested, and I just think that's so valuable. Um, so for my project, I was trying to think of whether there was any uh, data out there that I could tap into instead of going out and collecting my own measly six hours of data. Uh, and I was thinking about data I could use to address threats to urban wildlife. And that led me to wildlife rehabilitation. Uh, so I had previously done some volunteering as a, uh, at a wildlife rehab hospital, which gave me a lot of appreciation of the work that is involved there uh, and just how many patients they take in each year. Um, so a single hospital here in the Bay Area takes in thousands of patients a year, um, some of which take weeks or months to rehabilitate and release. So it's a huge job. Uh, and they take extremely detailed records throughout that process not only of the medical treatment, but also species that were found and brought in, uh, an idea of how old the species were, uh, as much information as they can get about when and where the species were found, and about how they were injured. Uh, so that jumped to my mind as something that seems like, hey, that's a lot of information there. A lot of it's really relevant to what I'm interested in. Uh, I did some literature review, and I did find some great previous studies on this topic. Uh, so that gave me the confidence that this has been done before. Not as many studies as I would have expected, um, but it also gave me some methodologies that I could draw inspiration from so I could see exactly how other people approach this uh, problem and then use that for mine. Um, so now that I was super excited about this idea, I needed to actually find some data to work with. Um, so I mentioned before, we don't work under an advisor. Any instructors that I have are either scattered about the country or the closest ones are in San Diego. Um, so since then, I've connected with SFBBO. I'm now part of a great local conservation community. This was before that. So I was just Gabby, the random grad student who didn't know anybody, uh, certainly didn't have any funding or like faculty working in this area. So I did what any good millennial will do, and I turned to Google. Uh, and I Googled wildlife rehabilitation in the Bay Area. I found every hospital anywhere remotely nearby, uh, and I emailed them. And I explained who I was, and I explained my project. Uh, and I was extremely lucky to get one great response from the Lindsay Wildlife Experience um, up in Walnut Creek. Uh, for those that don't know, this is a great organization. Um, they connect uh, people and wildlife through community outreach. Uh, they have a museum with some amazing animal exhibits. Um, up there, and they have a wildlife hospital on site, and they're kind of the big hospital for the Upper East Bay area. Um, 
So I was very lucky that the hospital manager there at the time was also super interested in this type of research, uh, and she gave me access to their raw data and their raw patient records, um, which is a, a really big deal. Uh, I heard from a couple other hospitals that, hey, it sounds like a cool idea, but we don't share our patient records with some random person off the street, no matter how nice you seem, uh, which is totally understandable. Um, so I, I cannot thank Lindsay Wildlife's experience enough for how open they were to collaboration. So now I had my idea, I had a partner, and I had some data. Uh, I had about four weeks left. Um, and I came up with my question to look at whether there were city level differences in the frequency of common uh, anthropogenic or human related threats uh, that led to the patients coming to the wildlife hospital. Um, most of the previous research on the topic primarily focused on the connection between the type of threat or the type of injury and the species. Um, I learned a lot about uh, the natural history of some species can make them more predisposed to certain threats than others. Uh, so one great example is that while domestic cat predation is a huge issue that affects pretty much all species smaller than a domestic cat, um, ground birds like the California quail are much more impacted by domestic cat predation than smaller birds that can more easily fly away or spend most of their time up in the trees. Uh, another interesting example was amongst the raptors, uh, Cooper's hawks are much more likely in one study um, to be injured by a window strike. Um, and part of the reasoning was that they spend more time hunting in backyards, staking out bird feeders. So then when they swoop in for the kill, uh, just their, their hunting style makes them more likely to be swooping in in areas that are right next to a, a bright shiny window that they don't realize is there. Uh, so there's a ton of interesting data on how susceptible certain species are to certain threats. There is not much on the geography and how that might be different depending on where you live. I did find one or two studies that looked at high level regional differences. Um, so ones that took a country and basically divided it into three to five regions um, and maybe found some trends but it was like, I think one of the studies was in Greece and one of their regions was this really remote part of Greece where nobody lives versus like the other places that actually have people. Um, and I think that is interesting, but a lot of the times the people working in conservation to tackle these problems are really small local organizations. Um, so my, my intuition there was even that regional level maybe isn't nuanced enough. Um, from a person, you know, even here in the Bay Area, living in San Jose and San Francisco, it's completely different. The cities are different. Um, the, the styles of people and environment are different. So it just seemed to make sense to me that the, the threats that wildlife face might be different even between nearby cities. Um, so my, my hope is that if we could find these meaningful localized differences, that could change how we approach uh, tackling and talking about some of these problems as small local organizations. Uh, given my time constraints, I decided to look at one year of data, and I looked at the most recent complete year at the time, which was 2016. Uh, it is worth noting that I did end up spending way more than six to eight hours uh, processing all of the raw data and playing with it, um, but it was totally worth it. I have since learned a lot of tools and techniques that would allow me to do that much faster, um, but I was doing a lot of it manually going through spreadsheets and I learned a lot. Um, in 2016, the hospital took in over 5,600 patients of 174 distinct species. Um, I know this is a San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory ev event, so if any of the bird people in the audience are starting to kind of nod off, I just want to take this moment to highlight the fact that <laughs> of those uh, species, 60 or 75 percent of the unique species were avian species, and 66 of the patients that brought in were brought in were birds. Um, when you stop to think about that, it's not necessarily surprising if you just think about your own day-to-day -day life going around the city. You do see more birds, but it's just really striking to think about how disproportionately birds are impacted and brought in. Um, 
there may be a bunch of reptiles out there that are also getting injured and people are just less likely to try rescuing them. Um, so that's another perspective, but uh, this is definitely a bird focused topic. Uh, this is a graph of the top 20 bird species that were brought in that year. Um, as you can see, there are four or five uh, big contenders. We have the morning doves with around 450 that were brought in that year. And then it kind of drops off at the tail end here. We're looking at um, like the black BB and the oak tip map. There was around between 30 and 40 patients brought in. Uh, the tail does trail off very quickly. Over around half of the unique species only had uh, five or fewer individuals brought in. Um, but what I think is interesting about this is if you look at the species names, we've got quite a variety. Um, you've got perching birds, you've got ground foragers, uh, you've got hummingbirds, um, water birds, a couple of species of hawks, and barn owls. Um, so that kind of just goes to illustrate how cross-cutting these issues are. There isn't just one species or one type of bird that is impacted in the Bay Area. Um, different threats are impacting pretty much all of them. Um, so like I said, there is a ton of interesting conversation to be had about the species and the threats, but my job was to uh, look at geography. Um, yeah, I can take some questions now. I just thought I can actually see the one online. Um, so we have a question from online asking uh, if I think that bird organizations or bird feeder manufacturers warn people um, not to put feeders next to windows. I have seen that warning from local organizations that I follow because I'm already really tapped into conservation, um, similar with warnings about regularly cleaning um, bird feeders um, to prevent disease spread. I don't actually know that I've ever seen bird feeders for purchase that have any kind of warning about how to best use them to protect birds. Um, so that would be a great point and a great way to, to collaborate. I've also, um, I recently did a bird box monitor training with uh, Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society and they pointed out the fact that most bird houses that people buy because they think they want to be helpful are actually really cute and decorative for the humans and completely useful for the, useless for the birds. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for people who are currently trying to market to the bird-loving community to do it in a way that is actually better for the birds and better informed. Because um, these are the kind of issues where I think there are some conservation issues that are, are really gnarly and really kind of controversial and so changing public opinion is tough. But I think that there are a lot of things out there that um, I know once I learned things like the fact that I had never cleaned my bird feeder was actually a threat to them and disease spread, I was like, oh man, as soon as I know this, I voluntarily want to change my behavior. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, but yeah, so like I said, I had to focus on geography. Um, patients were brought in from 114 distinct cities. Uh, including some all the way down here, like Sunnyvale and San Jose, which was interesting because we have our own wonderful wildlife rehab hospital down here in San Jose. Uh, 114 is a lot to analyze, and a lot of them, again, it was like one or two animals. Um, so I decided to focus on the top five cities, and that ended up being Concord, Walnut Creek, Oakland, Martinez, and Pleasant Hill. Uh, together, those five cities were around half of those 5,600 patients that came in, um, which makes sense because Lindsay is in Walnut Creek and those are kind of the, the bigger cities up there in that area. So my mission going through this uh, was to come up with the cause for admission and tie it to the city. Um, Lindsay Wildlife Center uses a great database. They have an online database for their records um, that was super helpful and super detailed. But it turns out they didn't actually have like a single cause for admission field. Um, they had intake notes that are based on the account of whoever brought in the animal. They have some examination notes from the ex uh, initial um, physical exam about the type of injury. Uh, so like sometimes those notes, you could have things like this animal is very clearly caught by a cat uh, or this animal exhibits injuries consistent with a window strike. Um, but they had all these different kind of freeform note fields and not a single like drop down categorization. 
So most of the work that I did was going through all of those notes and seeing where I could derive a root cause. Um, another interesting thing, because uh, I didn't really see anyone else mention this in their methodologies in my literature review, uh, sometimes, one thing that's tricky is sometimes there are a combination of factors that lead to an animal being brought in. Um, so one example was a bird flew into a window, uh, and then while it was on the ground, dazed and kind of recovering, someone's cat caught it. Um, yeah, so that bird had a real rough day. Um, and so the cat may have done most of the injury, but would the cat have caught it if it hadn't hit the window? Um, another example was um, a reason that a lot of babies are brought in is because they were orphaned. Um, but sometimes, like, baby opossums would come in orphaned because their mother was struck and killed by a car. Uh, so they could be saved, but the mother couldn't. So uh, what it seems like uh, in other studies, if they considered that kind of chaining of events at all, was they just went with the last cause in the chain. Uh, and I thought it was more important to go for the initial cause that kicked everything off. Um, so in my case, the window and the car strike were how I attributed those. Um, the one that is tricky that we couldn't really, I couldn't really get at through this record and would be harder, is sometimes there are unseen conditions. Um, so sometimes animals were brought in not because of an injury, but because of disease, um, so because of sickness. Uh, but sometimes you don't necessarily know, like, did the bird hit the window because it had this underlying disease no one could see that was you know, clouding its judgment, or were its reflexes slower because it was fighting off an infection and that's why the cat caught it. Um, so that was one level that I couldn't really address because the, the intake notes didn't necessarily cover that. Um, and it's just much harder to, to untangle. You don't have as much data on, like, how sick does a bird have to be before it is impaired enough for a cat to catch it. Um, but that's an interesting expansion for future research. Um, Initially, when I went through and categorized everything, I was extremely precise and extremely granular, and I wanted to preserve as much detail as possible, uh, which you have, if you have met me in person, shouldn't surprise you in the slightest. Um, but that gave me 33 different categories of injury. Uh, and again, that is kind of a lot for analysis, uh, and some of them had very few animals falling into them. Uh, so then I had to do a second pass over the data and kind of combine those back up to higher level categories. Um, so here are a couple of examples. Um, two that came up from time to time were finding uh, an animal, uh, often the water bird, tangled in fishing line. Uh, and then I actually wouldn't really have thought of this, but for me a surprising number of animals came in because someone found them trapped in the pool in their backyard. Um, whether it was a non-water bird or a small mammal, it was just stuck in the pool, may have been there for hours, um, so they took it in. So those were two of several categories that got merged into a higher level group for trapped or entangled. Um, and I also had separate versions of trapped and entangled for if it was human related. Um, so things like a pool or fishing line or garden netting um, or traps themselves. Um, a lot of humane or inhumane traps get put out and either catch what they're intended to or catch animals that they aren't intended to. Um, versus more natural things. So there were uh, sometimes animals were found just trapped in a, a natural hole. Um, there were several hummingbirds that were brought in because they were entangled in spider web. Um, so that was kind of a, not necessarily a human issue, so I wanted to document that separately. Um, the other example I have up here is uh, some of the animals, the only categorization in the notes was criminal activity. Um, which fortunately there was not a lot of, but there were cases. Um, based on some of the notes, I took that to mean just some, some pretty awful people out there decided to abuse an animal. Um, and I've heard patient stories from wildlife rehab hospitals that come in that way. Uh, on the other side of the humanity spectrum, you have the very large category of over rescue. Uh, and what that means is uh, a lot of animals, once they're young or old enough, just leave them unsupervised because their young are fine, um, but we well-meaning humans come along and find a baby bird or a baby bunny or a, a fawn and we see it alone and we assume it's abandoned and endangered and bring it in um, and it's actually not necessary, uh, so it's called over-rescue. Uh, a couple of the staff, 
based on the notes they left referred to it as kidnapping, um, <laughs> which is, is true. Um, so that was kind of a thing that I just merged together into human contact um, because if they had not come into either the, the poor meaning or the well-meaning humans, then they wouldn't have needed to go to the hospital at all. Um, the biggest thing that I did here that my current self really appreciates from my past self is I took very detailed notes uh, explaining why I classified certain things and how I categorized them. Um, it's easy to think, you know, when you're going out in the field and collecting data, you want to write a very detailed protocol and you don't really think about it the same way when you start analyzing existing data, but if you're going to be processing it and merging it and categorizing it, it's just as important to have a protocol and have a plan. Um, so I thoroughly, thoroughly endorse taking really detailed notes. Um, your future selves and anyone else who wants to build on your, your work will thank you. Uh, in the end, after I did all of this condensing, I took 33 original categories and got it down to 10. Um, so that was much more manageable for analysis and I think much more meaningful. Um, so there were around 1,600 records out of the five cities that I looked at where I could confidently assign a reason for intake. Um, sometimes there just weren't enough notes or the notes themselves even said, like, we don't know what happened to this animal. Um, depending on uh, a lot of the information came from the report of who brought the animal in. Uh, so those were cases where people could say, like, my cat caught it because, you know, they found it in their yard. They found the circumstances. Sometimes people bring it in and they either weren't there or they don't provide any detail. Um, and so then you just don't know. Um, so of the 1,600 records, around half of them uh, were ones that I assessed to be uh, human or anthropogenic in nature. Uh, and of that half, the top five categories represented 75% of the patients. Um, so that was, that was a lot of numbers and dividing. So around 1,600 or around 600 patients out of the original set um, were because of these top five human causes in those five cities. Uh, and I would like to turn it over to the audience real quick, in person and online, and see if anyone has guesses about what those top five threats are. Um, so feel free to just shout things out or type them into the chat online. Cat caught. Cat that is number one. Um, yes, our, our furry feline friends who we love very much are little murder machines when they are left to roam outside um, unsupervised. And I have read there are some studies that specifically try to quantify cat predation, and it's on the order of billions of birds and small animals each year in the U.S. alone. Um, and unfortunately, from what I, I have heard and from what I saw in some of the notes, those are also some of the most uh, gruesome injuries that come in, too. Um, we have a guess online for motor vehicle collision. Uh, and Jackie is correct. That is number two. Um, so you can see, even as the number two, it is just about half of the number of domestic cat victims um, that were brought in. So all of these top five are big offenders, but yeah, cats are, are really rough. Um, there are three more in the top five. Windows. Windows. Yes. Man, you guys are even getting these in order. <laughs> uh, number three was, uh, I categorize it as general collision, so either with a window or with a building. Uh, and yes, those usually ended up being being birds. Um, there are two more. So orphaned uh, was one of the top reasons. It wasn't one that I tracked as human related. Um, but yeah, I think, I think orphaned by itself was like the number one non-human cause and was like the vast majority of them. And those ones are tough to tell because sometimes you can tell when they're brought in that like they weren't really orphaned and yeah. sometimes it's like, well, could go either way. Um, any other guesses for the other two? Tree trimming. Tree trimming was in the, in the 10. It was not in the top five, um, but tree trimming was a big one. Um, that one I ended up kind of merging to with just other landscaping activities or um, the birds that nest like right up on buildings, like the mud nests. Um, there was a few where people were like, I was cleaning or painting my house and I accidentally knocked it down. Um, so I kind of had a whole category of yard and house maintenance. Um, 
Any other guesses? All right. Did you include the kidnapping? In the yes. So I include human causes, and it still ended up not being uh, quite as much as these top five. Um, because the, so like I was just saying, the tricky thing with the kidnapping is there were cases where they could definitively say that, like, this animal absolutely was not orphaned. And a lot of times they have notes where the person brought it in and they just sent it right back home with them. They were like, actually, you just brought it in. You just took it, like, you know, 15 minutes ago. Can you just put it back where you found it and everything's fine? Um, there were less, there were a lot more, probably a lot more cases of kidnapping, but they couldn't be differentiated from whether they were orphaned. So I played it conservatively. Uh, we have another guess online for fishing lines. And that is correct for number four, that category I mentioned about trapped and entangled. Um, and yeah, that included fishing lines, um, several cases of especially snakes getting tangled up in like the netting people put around their gardens, uh, and then traps that are deliberately put out to catch animals but often don't catch exactly the animal that you're trying to catch because the animals don't know who you're trying to, to persecute. Uh, and then the fifth one was dogs, so our other furry uh, companion. And so you see dogs, less than half of the cats, but still actually a significant number, um, which was interesting to me because dogs are usually much more supervised um, and usually with their owner. So a lot of these uh, appear to be cases where it was dogs in the backyard. So like I let my dog run around the backyard um, and they got into it with an opossum. Um, and then the animal had to be brought in. Um, poison was also a big one. Um, that was another guess online. It wasn't quite the top five. Um, but I don't know if any of you are following the news about all of the issues with um, rodenticide right now. Um, so people who are just trying to poison rodents in their yard are having a massive toll on the entire rest of the food chain. And there's actually some California legislation in progress trying to ban a lot of those. Um, so that's something you can learn more about if you're interested. Uh, so this graph at first is kind of just a wall of colors and it's a lot to take in. Um, but what you're seeing here is for each city, you're seeing the uh, rank and frequency of each of the top five sources that we just talked about. So again, you can see uh, the blue across the board cats are the worst offenders. Um, after cats being number one, there was not a consistent ranking for two through five. Um, so even just eyeballing this, there were a few trends that caught my eye. Uh, so you, if you look at Concord, uh, that first city there, um, that purple line represents a lot of dog attacks in Concord. Uh, and Concord had more than the other four cities combined, uh, which is very interesting. Dogs were usually the lowest in the other four. Um, another interesting one was in Walnut Creek, uh, the category of being trapped and entangled was seemed kind of relatively higher there than it had been for, for the other cities. Uh, and then the third really interesting one was in Pleasant Hill, all the way here on the right, uh, vehicle collisions, which was usually pretty high in other cities. They only had four for that year, uh, four patients brought in for vehicle collisions. So you can see right here just taking data that already existed, had already been created for not necessarily research purposes, and literally all I did was clean it up and graph it a little. And there are now all of these interesting insights to go dig further into and explore. Um, just one graph eyeballing it. Um, I did, uh, for the, the science validity, I checked those kind of initial eyeballing impressions with a statistical test. I use what's called a chi-square test of independence. Um, so I started by comparing all five cities at once. And what that was testing for was whether that distribution of threats was meaningfully different between the five cities or if that was all just kind of statistical noise and they were functionally the same. So the first test when I did all five cities against each other was a resounding yes, statistically significant, um, indicated that there was a difference. Uh, so then I got some help from a um, statistics consulting office that the university has, um, and they encouraged me to follow up with pairwise tests, doing each city compared to another one at a time, and that's kind of what I graphed here. So it turned out that the variation that was leading to my initial result was that Concord 
is just kind of different than uh, than everybody else. So there were no other two cities that were statistically significantly different from each other, uh, but Concord was was a big outlier. And just going back and thinking about that graph, my intuition is that it's probably that huge spike in dog attacks compared to everything else that was really throwing everything off. Um, so that was kind of my statistical analysis, uh, which was also another requirement of the project that I, I forgot to mention up front. We had to do some kind of statistical test. Um, the one thing I want to stress, though, is just because the other, those other interesting things we saw weren't statistically significant doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't still interesting and potentially meaningful. Um, I actually read some articles shared recently about some growing debate in the scientific community about the validity of relying on statistical significance as the be-all, end-all anyway. Um, so that's just an interesting note. Uh, so the question is, what does that mean? You know, obviously I was very excited to have some statistical tests tell me that my my hypothesis was correct, but what does that mean in the big picture? Um, and I think validating the idea that there may be, not maybe across the board, but there are sometimes these cases of city level differences, uh, it validates the value of looking for city le level differences in other areas and with more data. Um, and I think that's really important because it leads to all of these ways that we can customize and prioritize the work that we're doing for the cities that we're in. Um, so it opens up areas for future research, like why are there so many dog attacks in Concord? Uh, and then with just this couple week study that I did using this one year of data, we've gone from this really nebulous question about like, how could I do a better job of, of helping wildlife in the Bay Area or in my city to a very specific question. Um, and that makes it a lot easier to approach makes it a lot easier to find potential partners. So you're now no longer going from like, again, this nebulous question. You're like, okay, who are dog people in Concord? Like, are there organizations I could reach out to? If I find, if I go back and look specifically at where the animals were brought in, is there like one dog park? Or is it just that all of the dog owners let their dogs out in the backyard and that's an issue? And then from there, are there dog groups that I could connect with for outreach? Um, so it just makes it, it makes it a lot easier to ask the kind of questions that are easier to gain traction and gain support on. Um, like I said, you could also prioritize mitigation. So the domestic cat predation is a, a local, a national, a global trend that probably no matter where you are, if you want to work on curbing that issue, you're definitely doing a good thing. Um, but there may be other issues that are bigger in some cities than others. Um, so there's that spike in the uh, trapped and entangled category in Walnut Creek compared to the others. I just went back and glanced through my data and saw that a number of the patients that were attributed to that were ducklings um, who were orphaned because they fell through holes in a, a grate in the ground in a storm drain uh, and were ultimately rescued but couldn't be reunited with their family. Uh, so they had to finish being raised in the, the hospital. So that's again a really simple thing like maybe Someone should go check out where those were found. Are there storm drains in Walnut Creek that are a different design than others? Um, are they just maybe really close to an area where ducks breed? Could it be as simple as just changing the design or finding like a cover that you could put over? Uh, and all of a sudden you've now, with limited, limit, not, not limited effort, but a lower impact, higher value uh, solution, just because you knew a specific local issue instead of like, well, everywhere uses some kind of solution, so we might as well use it here and see what happens. You know going in what to look for. Um, and then the same thing with outreach. Um, I know firsthand from my, my work as an outreach intern that you have a lot of people and a lot of messages you're trying to get out and very limited time and resources to do it. So if you know specific issue relevant to the residents you are talking to that day um, in Pleasant Hill. Maybe they don't need advice on better ways to drive to avoid wildlife strikes because they already don't have that many. So maybe you can just skip over that and focus on one of the bigger issues because you actually know what those are. Um, so I think this is huge. I still think it's obviously a struggle for these same small local organizations to have the time to 
do this kind of analysis on their own. But if it can be done, now we can go to the people who, we can go to Lindsay, and I, I did share this data with them after, and say, hey, you work in these communities. Here are the trends that we're seeing if you want to use it to tailor your approach and do the most bang for your buck. Um, before I, I open it up to questions at the end of the presentation, I do have to admit that everything I've covered so far was the end of my research. Um, I did not have a chance to actually dive into all of these things I'm theorizing about why there were differences. Um, and there are so many, these were just like the things bubbling around in my head when I put together the presentation. There's so many factors that could be influencing this, uh, characteristics about the human population. Are there more people, more cars, more dogs in one city? Um, we've already talked about how certain species are more susceptible to an injury. So was that just because Walnut Creek has more ducklings than anywhere else? Like maybe, maybe that's the issue. Um, is it the city infrastructure, like those storm drains, uh, or basically literally anything else? Um, so there's a lot of questions about why, and I have to admit it's a little, a little nerve-wracking to be up here in front of all of you and be like, hey, I just got you all thinking about this really interesting topic, and I have absolutely no answers for you. Um, <laughs> but for me, this is actually really exciting because I took one idea and one question, and now it has spawned so many ideas for future projects um, that I would love to have all the time and funding to go answer all of these questions. Um, but it just proves how much is out there for anyone, for the researchers, for the students. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential. Um, so those were kind of the specific results of my study. And I think uh, if I did my job right, I have now convinced you about how valuable uh, the records that I used were. Um, there's a really a good term for what I'm talking about, so I'm, I'm kind of using professional wildlife records, um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, these are kind of things that are, I kind of view like there's a, a data spectrum, and on one end there's primary research that you had a protocol, you carried it out, it was either trained scientists or trained citizen science volunteers for a specific research question. So that is probably super high quality, you know exactly what you're getting, but it's very expensive and very time consuming. And then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, you have the type of citizen science that's usually referred to as opportunistic. Um, so things like iNaturalist and eBird uh, that are building these great databases and that have some validation techniques, but they're just people, they're just collecting data, you're getting variable quality, there's kind of inherent biases just based on where people are. So this, those are kind of the two ends of the quality spectrum. I think these records are somewhere in the middle and closer to the primary research side. Um, they're being created by trained professional staff or trained volunteers. Uh, they follow an internally consistent format. Um, I'm pretty sure like most uh, organizations or companies in the world, each hospital probably uses different systems, um, but internally they're consistent. Uh, and they include a wealth of information that's really relevant to those of us studying conservation. Like I said, you have species. What species are in the area? Where were they found? Um, half of the work that, that SFBBO does surveying is just go to a place and see what species you can find there. Um, so this is kind of along those lines. Uh, they include information about threats, and maybe from that you can derive some behavior. Uh, so there's just so much information that we would go out and collect anyway, and that maybe we can, can derive from records that aren't being generated specifically for research purposes. They're being generated because people are doing this work, um, but that makes them no less relevant. Uh, and so wildlife rehab are what we just focused on, and I think they're maybe the most commonly used so far, although still totally underutilized based on how valuable they are. Uh, but they are not the only type. Um, in my research and kind of exploring this area, I found a few other examples. Um, calls to animal control to report nuisance animals or perceived nuisance animals or um, ask for animals to be removed from someone's yard. I read one study that uh, relied on these to figure out the location and home range of um, nocturnal mammals that may be harder to study, especially when they're on private land. So they were looking at calls about 
like skunks, foxes, raccoons, and coyotes, and kind of deriving from where people were calling in, where were the animals? And that was really interesting. Um, similarly, roadkill cleanup records. Um, someone is out there doing the job, maybe not as consistently as they should be, based on how much roadkill we all see. Um, for another one of my projects, I did a bicycle roadkill study, which was informative, but very time consuming. Um, I've read studies that use data from Caltrans, uh, where they remove deer carcasses from the highways. So that was just a thing, like, they make work logs the same way any of us do, you know, responded to a call here, removed a carcass, and from that, uh, the researchers that I, I read the work of were using it to determine uh, roadkill hotspots so that they could plan, if you can only put in so many wildlife crossings, where do you prioritize it? Um, and again, those were records that existed anyway, would exist anyway, and they were able to partner with Caltrans for it. Uh, some cities may have their own special reporting requirements. Um, I added this one on really recently, totally unrelated to this topic. I was just reading the city of Sunnyvale's bird safe design requirements because I wanted to learn more uh, best practices about that building design. And I noticed at the very bottom, they had a note that said, uh, per Sunnyvale's municipal code, if your building meets these criteria, you also need to submit an annual report of dead birds that you find within like a radius of your building. Um, so I haven't seen that report. I didn't really follow up on that. But there may be all of this data about bird strikes uh, in at least the city of Sunnyvale that's just sitting there waiting for someone to partner with them and also put it to our own research use. And then I am sure that there are so many more um, based on me stumbling over that, that bird strike example literally two weeks ago um, that are just waiting to be discovered again by people working in the field or by students who are, are looking for projects and for exploring. Um, so just to quickly conclude and kind of summarize everything, um, my specific project did provide evidence that there was meaningful city level differences uh, in the human threats to wildlife. That is important because it opens up all kinds of avenues for future research, um, very specific mitigation efforts, and then tailored outreach efforts. And all of those potential applications illustrate how immensely useful wildlife rehabilitation and these other kind of professional wildlife records are. Uh, and I cannot stress this enough how currently underutilized there are um, for how valuable this is. Um, there are still very few studies um, and most of those use wildlife rehabilitation records and don't even touch any of the other possibilities. Uh, and then the last thing, um, so I, I love coming to SFBBO science talks and hearing from all of these local scientists, um, but as a student myself, it's a little intimidating at the same time as being inspiring. You're like, how do I get from there to here where I'm like, you know, several years into a PhD and have these multi-year projects? Um, so I really just want to re-emphasize the fact that when I did this project, I was just a random person, um, no credentials, uh, I had an idea, I reached out on a, on a whim on some Google searches to look for partners, um, and this is where it brought me. So I am very confident that if I can do this, then anyone in this audience can, uh, can do the same thing and can get some great insights, and I look forward to hearing about those someday. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I would love to open it up for questions, both, again, on person and line. Yes? When you are extracting the data from the records, do you have any kind of report you went for, or were you looking individually at all of 1,600 records from the five cities and like taking a manual spreadsheet? That is a great question, so I'll repeat it online. Um, so the question was, when I extracted the records, was I running some kind of keyword search or was I just manually uh, looking at everything? Um, so I did it manually, but I would not do it manually again now that I have learned from it. Um, there was just being unfamiliar with the data and how the staff, like they may have taken notes in a consistent way, but I didn't necessarily know it. Um, I kind of just went through everything and then if I had to do it for a second year of data, I would say like, okay, I know that anytime it's a cat, 
they literally say cat somewhere in the notes. And so I can just search for that next time and narrow it down that way. Um, but yeah, I, and I think the, the database, they use um, uh, WORMD, WRMD. Um, so I probably could have done it all on there. I was like super paranoid about doing anything that would slow it down for them. So I also exported it all into a spreadsheet. So I was always working locally. Um, but yeah. And then, yeah, I've learned about tools too, like um, I'm doing some work with R right now, that even that kind of manual process of collapsing and counting and sorting, I now know enough that I can do that much more quickly in an automated way as opposed to by hand like I did back then. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question, just to summarize, was I just lumped all species together, um, and birds and mammals and, and reptiles and amphibians do have such different behavior. Um, so if I divided it up and just looked at even one class of species at a time, um, I do absolutely think that there would be differences. Um, I think there are some threats that are um, much more relevant to, you know, maybe birds or mammals than others, um, and that if you were trying to focus on a specific species or a specific set of species that you would see kind of those meaningful differences. And even, um, even within certain cities, and again, maybe some cities just have more of one type or another, um, but uh, like there's a lot of ducklings and opossums that would come in orphans um, because those are both uh, animals that are pretty prevalent that have very large groups of young, um, but they get orphaned for completely different reasons. Um, so like the ducklings were orphaned for the storm grains. Uh, the opossums were almost always orphaned because the mother was killed um, or there were a few where they were riding around on the mother's back and a dog barked at the mother and scared it away and one of the babies fell off in the haste. Um, so even certain like kind of general reasons um, tie back to different root causes for different species, um, which is really interesting. Um, we had a couple questions online. Um, Urban wildlife management is such an up-and-coming field. What inspired you to contribute to the growing body of literature? Um, there's kind of two aspects that got me interested in this. One was, um, it's going to sound a little silly, I'm kind of a homebody. So a lot of the people I know who are, are interested in conservation research are like, okay, I'm making plans to finish my degree and move to Africa and do like five years of field work. Uh, and that's not really me. Um, I, I love that, but I also love where I live and the comforts I live in. So that kind of first got me thinking about North American wildlife and urban wildlife. Um, and then in my own life, I'm really big on kind of easy, manageable behavior change and ways that I can help. And big issues like climate change or just the overdevelopment of the Bay Area are huge, important problems that people need to tackle, but they're much harder for me, um, they kind of seem more overwhelming and hopeless, whereas those things like as soon as I learned how to better maintain my bird feeder, um, that was something I can jump on and that's something that I can tell other people about. Um, and I like the idea of studying and focusing on, I use the word byproducts at the beginning, um, byproduct threats. So things like, like I said, it's a harder case to make like, hey, I know that this company, like company you want to build on this land and make millions of dollars, but like I'm going to make a case for like, please don't because burring owls live here. Um, that's a much harder battle to fight than the people who are doing harm to wildlife completely unintentionally and unaware um, and just reaching them and giving them easy shifts. Um, so that's an area that I'm very excited about. Um, and urban areas just are continuing to spread around the world and they just have so many people. So any one of us doing a very small amount of harm adds up very quickly when there are millions of us all packed in here. Um, 
Are there public campaigns to educate the public about cat predation and keeping cats indoors? There are. Um, I don't think there are enough uh, because it is such a huge problem. Um, there are, I'm actually doing a little bit of research on both sides of the cat issue because I also love cats. Um, and it is, you know, if the solution is just round up all the cats and euthanize them, like, that's not a very appealing solution either. Um, so I can see why the, the people who feed cats outdoors also the case that they're making. Um, so one, another project I did, we had to do one that was kind of create some kind of digital uh, media to convey a message. Um, so the one I focused on was um, a little website about cat enrichment indoors. Because um, what I have found from most people I talk to, the few friends of mine that have indoor outdoor cats, um, it's not that they don't care or it's not that they, you know, they think it's cool that their cat is probably killing tons of wildlife. They're just genuinely worried because there's this notion that if you keep your cat cooped up inside, it'll have a sad, meaningless existence. Um, so the, the direction I kind of took is showing how you can give your cat a fully enriched, meaningful existence indoor or um, give it outdoor experiences that are the same way we do with dogs that are supervised or that are fenced in. Um, but yeah, given the scale of this problem, um, I think there's not enough education right now because there's just not enough dedicated to it. But it's also some people understandably kind of shy away from it because it's a lot more controversial to say, you know, round up feral cats or keep your cat inside than it is to say, like, clean your bird feeder. Um, so yeah, I know some great scientists who know it's a big issue and are like, yeah, but the cat people are kind of scary. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, utilize every record, or were there any that were like ambiguous about the admission reason for admission? And so, those like, yeah. So, of the so the question is, was I able to utilize every record or only a subset of the um, the 5,600 original ones? Let's see, half of them were from the top five cities, so that was around 2,800, and only around 1,600 of those were ones that I could confidently. Okay. Um, and there were some. So another thing that I made note of in my, my little methodology was um, the staff would make notes, sometimes would say, like, definitely a cat, probably a cat, maybe a cat, or possibly a cat. So anytime it was, like, maybe or possibly, I wouldn't include it. And if it was probably or definitely, I would. Um, but that was one of the things that where if I had actually been working with the staff and I could talk to them and say, like, hey, so when you say maybe, like, how confident are you? Or is it just, like, a wild guess? Um, that was something I could could do more of. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah, so suspect was another one, and it did usually come up with poisoning or lead poisoning. Um, and that one, because I knew that bit of context you mentioned, that it's, it's hard to definitively know without lab testing. I believe I did include those. Okay. And it was kind of just the ones where, um, and so when you're, you're publishing reports like this, you make sure to include all of those notes. Like, okay. by the way, there were some cases where uh, it was kind of in the probably category, and I, I included it based on, on background knowledge of the records. Um, but uh, yeah, it was really only the ones that was like, might have been a cat, not sure that I, to be safe, I still classified them, so I had them, but I didn't include them in the final analysis. Um, and I didn't actually think about it until I was talking to you just now, but it would have been interesting to run the analysis multiple times, like including those and not, to see if it changed the results. Um, so that's a thing you could do if you were tracking all of them. Mm -hmm. Did you have a, another question? Well, I thank you. I very much appreciate that. It helps that with some of these issues, like the cat one, I kind of started on the wrong side. 
So like as a kid, I loved cats. And then I heard about these organizations that are taking care of the cats that live outside and have no homes. And I'm like, this is great. And then once I got more into biology and conservation, I was like, oh, this is maybe not so great. But I can still empathize with my former self and all of the other people out there who are in the other camp. Um, but yeah, it is really tough when there are multiple valid sides to an issue. It's way easier when there's just like a very clear cut villain, which is basically never the case. <laughs> all right, uh, I don't see any more questions online. Um, so I'm gonna close down the online meeting. Um, thank you everyone who joined us online and in person. Um, this has been recorded and we will do something with the recording. Uh, we're not sure what, but uh, I appreciate everyone for coming out. Thank you.